to encourage each of us um, to listen to the Apostle Paul as he encourages us to uh, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within us. Uh, we're going to be looking at Colossians 3.16, but what I'd like to do is read verses 1 through 25, or actually the entirety of chapter 3 as we begin. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, nor not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. And by the way, let me just ask you, as I, as I read this, didn't you sense, at least for the time that I was reading it, a certain, a certain sense of, um, of strength, a certain sense of direction, having your eyes opened, your, your mind, as it were, expanded, being reminded of the things that are in the Word of God. We need this Word to be strong, and that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And essentially, I've already answered this question that I wanted to start off with, and that is whether you want to be a stronger Christian whether you want to be more like Jesus Christ, whether you want to have more love for him, whether you want to have greater love for others. You know, those who have just joined with us and the membership of the church and those of us who are already members made a promise to the Lord. 
that with his help and by his grace, this is what we will try our very best to do. Not simply because we become members of a local church, but because as those who belong to the Lord, this is what we want to do more than anything else. And so anything that, that we can discover, as it were, that will help us to do this should be welcome. Well, this morning we're going to look at one very important way, and that is by listening to what Paul says here. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now, in our Wednesday study, those of you who were there on Wednesday know we heard Sinclair Ferguson uh, comparing the spiritual strength of the typical believer today with those uh, that lived basically during the time of his youth and with those who lived during the time of the Reformation. And he noted that on the whole, we have been growing progressively weaker in our spirituality from generation to generation. Now, the reason he noted is that this is because we are less in the Word. Today, the average believer may hear the Word preached once a week for a 30-minute sermon. As a matter of fact, this sermon may actually end up being less than 30 minutes this morning. A generation ago, he noted, the average was three times a week, and the sermons usually lasted about 40 minutes. But during the Reformation, he said it was closer to nine times a week, again at about 40 minutes each time. They were in the Word more. Now, this doesn't take into account how much time the average believer in each generation actually spent reading and studying the Bible on their own. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that they are also doing this more in the past than we do in the present. But the net result is we are not as spiritually strong as they were. We are not as filled with the Spirit's presence. We are not as in love with Jesus as they were. If we want to love Him more, if we want more of the Spirit's presence, if we want to be spiritually stronger, we need to be more in the Word and even perhaps, to put it more accurately, the Word needs to be more in us. Paul writes in Colossians 3.16 again, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now this morning what I'd like to do is consider four things. First of all, what Paul means by letting the word of Christ richly dwell in us. Secondly, what the connection is between his word dwelling in us and Christ dwelling in us. Thirdly, what happens when the Word dwells in us richly? And then fourthly, how we can have it dwelling in us more than we do. So first of all, what does Paul mean when he says that we should let the Word of Christ richly dwell in us? Well, by the Word of Christ, he certainly could be referring narrowly to the gospel or he could be referring more broadly to the scriptures. But you know, since the whole of the Bible has to do with Jesus, it basically has to do with the gospel, who he is, what he would do, and how those who trust in him should live. And since the Lord also gave us his word by his Holy Spirit in order that we might know him, it, this is more likely what Paul has in mind, essentially all of the scriptures. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And let me just remind you at this particular juncture, when Paul wrote this, the New Testament essentially had not been written yet. He was referring to the Old Testament Scriptures. Sometimes we think the Old Testament is, is basically a sort of a knockoff part of the Bible that we don't really have to pay attention to. But he says all Scripture is inspired, and it is all profitable. But it's only profitable, of course, if we listen to it. Now, what's important to note here is what Paul tells us to do with the Word of Christ. He says, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. He says, we are to let it live in us. Not to be as a transient guest, like somebody you have over for dinner that's there for a short time and then after dinner is over, they go home. But rather, to live there permanently, 
like the members of your family. Let the word of Christ live in you. Another thing worth noting here is, is um, the way that this is translated isn't really quite it doesn't really quite reflect the strength of what Paul is saying because Paul here isn't saying that we should let it do this as though the Word of God needed our permission, but that this is what it must do. It must dwell in us. This is our Lord's will. This is His desire that His Word live in us. So Paul says the Word of Christ must live in you. And then lastly, he says, or tells us how it should live in us. Basically, not scantily, you know, not just a little here and a little there, but he says richly, which means in a large amount or abundantly, to the point where it directs our thinking, takes hold of our imagination, fills our lives, transforms them into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it means to have the Word of God richly dwelling in you or the Word of Christ. Now, secondly, what is the connection between Christ's Word living in us and Christ Himself living in us? This is a connection that uh, Sinclair Ferguson drew, which I thought was an interesting one. Well, essentially, to have one living in us is to have the other living in us because they are really the same thing. Now, the Bible tells us there's at least two ways that Jesus lives in us. And the first way is the most obvious way and perhaps the way we think of. First of all, that is by the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in Romans 8 verses 9 through 11 that the Spirit's living in us or dwelling in us is the same as having Christ dwelling in us. Let me just read it for you and notice the interchange of the terms the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ and Christ living in us. He says this, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The simple point is to have the Spirit of Christ living in you is to have Christ living in you. Well, the same thing that's true of the Spirit is also true of the Word of God, at least in the sense that Paul is referring to here. Jesus says in John 15, verse 4, Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Then he goes on to say in verse 7, very similar to what Paul does in Romans chapter 8, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The idea here is that my words abiding in you are parallel to Christ's abiding in you. Jesus' word living in us is the same as his living in us because Jesus is the word. I think you're familiar with the opening verse of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the living word of God. He is the divine logos. He is God's communication to man. He is the one who sent His Spirit to inspire the Word of God. He is the one who came down personally to reveal God to us in a way that we could see and understand. Jesus, being the eternal Son of God, became man. And He is the one who explained the Father to us. He's the one who showed us His love and the one who showed us how to love. While the Scripture is His written Word, the perfect record of who Jesus is, of how he has loved us, and how we are to love others. When the word of Christ lives richly within us, when it permeates our lives, when it controls our thinking, then Jesus is truly living in us. Now we want to see a little bit more about how this works, and that brings us to the third point. 
what happens when the word of Christ or Christ himself lives in us in this way? Well, I think the obvious answer is we become like him. We live as he would live if he were living our lives. We love as he would love. We bear fruit. We bear the good fruit he wants us to bear as those branches connected to the vine. Jesus tells us in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Now we usually think of fruit bearing as the Spirit's work in our souls, and certainly it is. But what we need to see here is that the Spirit of God does not work apart from the Word, but He works through the Word. The Word is the blueprint. Jesus, I should say, the Spirit of God is the one who worked through the Gospel to save us. He's the one who makes it the power of God to salvation. And He works through the Word to sanctify us or to make us more like Jesus. And he does it essentially this way. He takes the word of God and he shows us the beauty of Jesus in the word. He's the one who gives us a love for it. He shows us that glory and draws our hearts out to it. He moves us in that direction, makes us want to go that way so that we become more like him. This is what Paul is referring to in Romans 8.14. When he says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, we don't believe that that means, as, as believed in charismatic churches, that when I feel like doing something, I do it because it's the Spirit in me that's telling me to do that. When I begin to think something, that this is the Spirit showing me that this is the way to go. What he's talking about here is when the Spirit of God gives you a love for the Word of God and you are then going that direction, that is the leading of the Spirit. He leads you in the Word of God. He controls your thinking through the Word, your desires through the Word. This is the standard. This is the touchstone. Now, Paul tells us that one of the ways that this works itself out in our lives, interestingly enough, is in our singing. We will become a source of instruction and correction to one another. And he means perhaps either by what we're singing or maybe by the way that we're singing. I mean, look at the connection in Colossians 3.16 where he says this. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Basically, he says that, I mean, this teaching and admonishing, which takes place in other venues as well, is, is accomplished through our singing. And we kind of wonder how that could be. But if we only heard Jesus sing, I think we would undoubtedly know what Paul was talking about here. But this is the way we ought to be singing when our lives are permeated with the word of Christ and we are filled with the spirit of God. Now, the Spirit's work will be seen in every other area of our lives as well as He makes us more and more like our Savior, our Savior who loved His Father with all His heart, who loved His, his own as the members of His own body, and who loved His neighbor as He loved Himself. That is what we will see working in our lives according to to the Word of God. Now, if the Spirit is to do this work in us, Paul says, we must have Christ's Word living richly in us. I mean, as Christians, we can't be devoid of the Word. The Word is already there, but I believe this, this command reminds us that sanctification, again, is a work that we do with the Spirit of God. There's something we need to do. We do need to yield to the Spirit of God as he leads us in the word, but we need to be getting the word in in order to know where the spirit is leading us. So the final point is this, how can we have more of his word living in us? Well, if we're already trusting Jesus Christ, we do have the first part of the equation. We do have the Holy Spirit 
in us. We couldn't do it apart from Him. And let me just say, if there's any here this morning not trusting the Lord Jesus, this is where the process begins for you. You need to look to the Lord for His Holy Spirit so that you might trust Him and that He might do this work in you. But for those of us who have the Spirit of God in us, we need to focus more on the Word. Remember what I began with, the illustration of St. Clair Ferguson as far as how much we are in the Word compared to the generations before us, how much they were in the Word. We need to be more in the Word. It doesn't come by sleeping on a Bible. You know, it doesn't come by having lots of Bibles and lots of books about the Bible on your shelf. You actually need to pick that book up and you need to read it. You need to read it more. Let me ask you, how much time are you spending in the Word? That will have a direct bearing on how much you will grow. If you read it a little, then you will grow little. But if you read it much, then you will grow much. I think it's instructive that Martin Luther was asked at the end of his life, if he had his life to live over again, what would he do differently? And this was coming from a man who spent more time in the Word of God than probably anybody else on the planet in his time. He said he would read what men had written less and he would have read the Word of God more. I think that's very good counsel. We need to read the Bible more. We need to read it not only as individuals, but we need to read it together. And we have that opportunity, of course, to read the Bible together with our brothers and sisters as we go through the Reading the Bible Together program. If you're not reading it and you'd like to join us, we're currently in 2 Samuel. Pick up, take up and read as Augustine heard coming from across the wall. We're going to meet to discuss that on the 28th. Now again, reading the Bible of God is one thing, and that's not all that's necessary. You do need to make sure you study the Word of God, that you memorize the Word of God, that you meditate on the Word of God, try to understand what it's saying. You need to let it work on your heart to, to surrender to what it is you're thinking about, what it is that it's telling you. And of course, most of all, you need to apply it in every area of life. Read the Word and let it work on you. Listen to the Word of God preached. You know, Ferguson was focusing just on the sermons preached, but there's, you know, there's the Word of God as we've already seen, but we do need to focus on sermons because that's why the Lord ordained the exposition of His Word, the preaching of His Word in the way that He has in His church because we need this. Take advantage of the two services we have on the Lord's Day. Take advantage of the midweek study. We come together to study the Word. Ferguson's lessons have been very helpful. And we're going to be ahead if we actually listen to them versus not listening to them. We need, of course, whenever we listen to any exposition of the Word of God, any teaching, we do need to make sure that we compare what we're hearing with what we see in the Word of God. Be like Bereans. Don't just take anything out of hand. Make sure it is what the Bible is saying. We can listen to sermons throughout the week now. I mean, we, can, we could listen to sermons basically every waking hour if we wanted to with the resources we have. We could listen to the Bible on CD or MP3. We need to hear the Word. That's the point. Another point is this. Especially in our circles, I think we have this tendency to focus a great deal on theology, which is very important. We need to have correct theology, but we also need to have a better understanding of how the Lord wants us to live. And sometimes we think if we understand all this, the mysteries that the Word of God reveals, that somehow we know what we need to know to live. There's also the matter of ethics. We need to know what the Bible teaches regarding what's right and what's wrong, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. We need to learn how the Lord wants us to live. We need, in other words, to learn what Jesus gave us His Word to teach us. Paul says, the Word of Christ must dwell richly within you. But again, most of all, we need to allow it to do its work in us. We need to yield to the Spirit of God as He uses it to change our thinking, 
to change our hearts, to change our lives. We need to make the Word our standard of living, how we determine what's right and wrong, what's true, what's an error. We need to make decisions based upon the Word of God and not on the opinions of men. Our lives need to be saturated with the truth of the Word because it's only when you actually yield to the Word of God and you live as the Lord directs you to live in the Word that you're really living like Jesus, remember whose example we are called to follow. He came down to show us the way and we are supposed to be following the way that He shows us. That's what being a Christian is really all about. Christian means little Christ. Christians or the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch because the people who saw them saw they were living like Jesus. The reason they were living that way is because they were following his example. They were living according to the word and that set you apart from the world. So let, or I should say, the word of God, the word of Christ must richly dwell in each of us if that is going to happen. Let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us um, to do what we need to do in order that our lives may be controlled by his word.